Thank you very much, John. And it's good to be back in DCU. I think John and myself were the original guinea pigs for, for uh, DCU when it was known as NIHE and there was less than 250 uh, students. Uh, but it's good to see that we're still alive and kicking in a journalistic sense some 30 years later. Um, I'm going to give a quick sort of response on, on issues of dominance and, and probably of referring to the broader forces at play. Um, and um, I'm sure there's a fair few uh, people in this room who are wondering what I'm going to say about Dennis O'Brien uh, and specifically how his dominance of, of the Irish media world manifests itself. And I will address that presently. Um, but I would stress uh, that dominance comes in many forms, as you probably appreciate. Likewise, many of the concerns I would raise would apply to anyone with a similar concentration of ownership to Dennis O'Brien. But obviously, events of the past few weeks are especially pertinent, pertinent in relation to Dennis O'Brien. I have no doubt an evaluation of coverage of the site serve controversy, Catherine Murphy's dull statements and Dennis O'Brien's response across print, broadcasts and online would, would tell a revealing story in itself. In my view and in light of our deliberations today, it would expose the consequence of marketplace imbalance and in some cases a tangible blunting of journalistic content. When I attended DCU, getting out the ruler and measuring as an indication of the scale of coverage or not was a valuable indicator. Telling analysis could start there. I'm more than happy with the Irish Times positioning within all of that. I would contend that we underlined our independence and the robustness of our journalism. Of course, there are those who said we should have gone ahead and published Deputy Murphy's statement, as in their considered view, there was no legal issues arising. Unlike some publications, INM included, we took a decision from the start that we were determined to publish and would pay whatever price was necessary to defend a journalistic principle, as we had in the Geraldine Kennedy column Kena versus Mahan Tribunal case. The only issue was how. Tactically, the court route was more sensible this time, i.e. going to the High Court at the soonest opportunity to seek clarification in light of the Binchy injunction in place as a consequence of the RTE case. All told, I think it was a good outcome for us in the shape of a significant ruling Notwithstanding the view in some quarters that we should have published the Murphy Statement in the Dáil without legal clarification and under supposed cover of absolute privilege, according to members of the Oireachtas. In such circumstances, as one academic lawyer noted, it is too easy for those who would not be risking anything to criticise the caution of those who would. The Irish Times, going back many years, has suffered financial wounds as a consequence of defending journalism in the public interest. It will do so again in the future, I have no doubt. There was also a significant amount of reaction after the Binchy ruling to the effect, so what was the problem? Central to the problem was the fact that there was a prior court order of Judge Binchy, which on its terms prohibited reporting the information contained in the Murphy Statement. That court order included a specific exception which permitted one of the previous statements made in the Dáil by Miss Murphy to continue to be reported, the inclusion of that exception gave rise to the inference that reporting of other Doyle statements, including the Murphy statement at issue here, was not permitted by the order. I agree with the view that the now established precedent should be regarded as among the most useful contributions to media freedom in Irish constitutional history. Judge Binchy has said not just that he didn't intend to restrict reporting of the Doyle statements by way of his order, but importantly, that he does not believe that he would have been entitled to do so. Articles 15.12 and 15.13 were not clear. There was no judicial authority of the import of Article 15.12 that all official reports of the Oireachtas and utterance made in either house, wherever published, shall be privileged in the context of the right of the media to report. Furthermore, when Article 15.13 goes on to state that members of the Houses are not amenable to the courts for any utterance they make in the House. It, by omission, suggested that the media could be amenable, for example, in a contempt of court context, and therefore that whatever privilege might exist for the, for the media would not be an absolute protection. The judge declined to take the easy way of resolving the case on the basis that 
the relevant information was already in the public domain. He also acknowledged why parties felt they had to come to court to clarify the issue. Judge Binsky could simply have availed of the legal principle not to issue court orders which have no practical effect, i.e. it devalues the currency, and ruled on that narrow basis. Instead, he went into broader waters to reach a much more useful decision, and I believe must have been encouraged in doing so by the fact that ourselves and RTE were appearing in front of him to argue the broader principle. Readers and viewers may well have wondered why such an elementary question as whether Oireachtas privilege extended to fair media reports of Deputy Murphy's utterance had not been settled a long time ago. But now, if we are concerned with the reporting of alleged libel in the Oireachtas, there is an answer, namely that the media would be protected by the Defamation Act. But it is important to place that Dennis O'Brien issue in the context of a domestic market where there is other <coughs> obvious dominance, such as that arising from Sky News International, the strength of broadband providers, big telecoms operating here, and to some extent RTE. These entities have to be considered in any evaluation and response, if any evaluation and response is to be meaningful in the context of enhancing plurality, maintaining diversity, and protecting the ability to do public interest journalism. Equally, collaboration has to be in the context of a glo global media world that is in the throes of unprecedented fragmentation, a recasting of the media business model, dominance manifesting itself across 100 countries and more, new, even bigger players that don't necessarily have traditional news values, and digital natives that seek and need rapid growth to survive. The growth and increasing dominance of digital intermediaries such as Facebook, Google and key players in social media channels has been accelerating and in many ways is the most significant manifestation of dominance. At one level, we in the Irish Times have a good relationship with these intermediaries. They have recognised the strength of our content in their channels. There are indications they want to move more into the content news game. Most major news brands and media brands in the US and Europe are examining their relationship with these intermediaries. Collaboration up to recently was almost exclusively with high-profile US organizations, mainly in the form of featuring journalistic content in more distinct ways via the intermediary primarily, though Google recently announced a partnership option with leading European publishers on product development research on digital sustain sustainability, and the funding of digital journalism projects. The crux is that by any yardstick, yardstick, it is an unbalanced relationship. The Facebook app, for example, has a 77% reach on mobile devices, and 88% of so-called millennials get news from that source regularly, so its importance in the media space cannot be understated. Facebook can be a means of recruiting new subscribers for the Irish Times, yet over-alliance risks weakening our brand. And as news organizations, we are vulnerable to al algorithm changes that determine rank ranking order, notably in search, which is critically, critical to traffic. As Dr. Jane Souter noted in today's Irish Times, Facebook algorithms essentially decide which news any individual gets to see based on some unknown combination of their past likes and those of their friends. Arguably, news providers, including smaller ones like ours, cannot afford not to be involved, but we don't have control of the distribution channel anymore. It's in the hands of others, and we have to accept that. The internet and social media, nonetheless, are inherently democratic because of the ability to allow everyone to participate, especially when facilitated by good broadband. That is an immense and overarching positive. Increasingly, however, influential gatekeepers such as search engines, social networks, and app stores are the route through which citizens access information and as such play a significant role in determining what users see or not. Moreover, the accelerating dominance of the smartphone means impacts arising from dominant internet providers, device manufacturers, and multinational telecoms cannot be ignored. I agree with Professor Philip Napoli of Rutgers University. A broader debate about the public interest when it comes to digital intermediaries is necessary. It flies in the face of reality that in light of concerns in this regard, 
highlighted by the Irish Times and the NUJ, that the government should conclude, insofar as they affect more media plurality in the state, that no action is required or recommended. Moreover, what's needed is deeper discussion about algorithm governance, for example, the rules and regulations around search engine queries. With public interest journalism, Napoli contends it's about integration through regulatory oversight or professional codes of conduct of well-articulated news values and institutional articulations of social responsibility that have up until the internet era accompanied the development of each significant news platform. Call me old fashioned, a denier who works for a legacy media business, but I believe copyright has to be also part of the conversation on how best to maintain media plurality. Appropriately applied and with the right degree of flexibility and pragmatism, it is not a barrier to innovation. If legislation doesn't protect the publisher's investment and if others develop business models based on utilizing content paid for by others, we will end up with content of little or no value. Within the Irish context, we now have published guidelines on media mergers. They outline how the Minister for Communications will apply the relevant criteria when assessing the impact of a proposed merger on media plurality. I welcome their introduction because we are living in an era where in many jurisdictions, the financially powerful have effective control over a large part of our media. I don't doubt the Minister's commitment to addressing complex issues that arise in that context. The new public value test is the most important element in this framework. It is backed by a more, a more thorough definition of media concentration than before. There is greater clarity on the advisory panel that will assess media plurality and concentration, backed, backed by the right blend of expertise though we believe a more extensive repurposing of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland is required if it is to evaluate cross-sectoral mergers effectively. The BAI will make the ultimate recommendation to the Minister on mergers that range far beyond its current broadcasting remit. Its composition is dominated by ministerial, i.e. political nominees, who make up five out of nine of its members, as I understand it. The other four are appointed by an Oireachtas committee. It is arguably neither expert nor independent in the sense that the press council is. Given the strong statements in the guidelines concerning the public interest and threats to democracy, it is beyond comprehension in my view that there is nothing in the guidelines that confronts the situation we find ourselves today rather than addressing solely possible future developments. I agree with Michael McDool. It does not make sense to establish criteria by which any future merger or concentration of media power would be judged, while at the same time leaving all existing arrangements untouched. This is on the basis that divestment in the area of competition is not novel. No retrospection means, I believe, the proposal that the BAI would regularly review the operation of media in the state will be of limited value. I accept we operate within the realm of what Marie McGonigal has referred to as a complex web of structures and all that goes with it. That backdrop underlines how difficult it is to monitor media pluralism and to determine how quantitative and qualitative indicators that might best feed into the process of evaluating media mergers. As the previous expert group on mergers has advised, and I see Colin Kenny is with us today, Concrete indicators of diversity have to be backed by consumption metrics that are included in any assessment of the desirability of media takeovers. A lot to discuss. I commend DCU for facilitating consideration of this issue, which is critical to the well-being of the media that operate within our democracy. Thank you very much.